Good evening, everyone. This is Benedict Klecka, director of the Redwood Library, uh, presenting this evening from my home in East Greenwich, Rhode Island. Uh, and that is due to weather conditions. Um, the weather people are forecasting some very serious winds and a possible storm. So we deemed it better that I uh, speak from here. Uh, it could happen that we have some power issues. So if, if your screen goes blank, well, hopefully that won't happen, but we will reschedule or hope for a reconnection somehow. Um, keep in mind that you can um, ask some questions at the say something nice button and also at the uh, ask a question button. Uh, and we'll be glad to uh, present those to our two speakers uh, after uh, their presentation. Uh, this evening, um, we have two outstanding journalists uh, who are um, work for the Wall Street Journal to talk about this incredible scandal of the college admissions, uh, which is uh, their book is the definitive treatment of that episode. Um, Melissa Korn is a higher education reporter for the Wall Street Journal. And previously, she wrote for Dow Jones Newswire, and she is a graduate of Cornell University of Columbia University School of Journalism. Uh, the co-author, Jennifer Levitz, is a national reporter for the Wall Street Journal. Uh, previously, she wrote for the Providence Journal, so she is um, a Rhode Islander, or not really, but she's come home to Rhode Island temporarily. <laughs> Uh, she has been a member of two Pulitzer Prize finalist teams, and she graduated from Loyola University of Maryland. So two distinguished speakers, and uh, they're going to talk to us about their new book and all of the details that they have covered about the story. So uh, welcome, everyone, and welcome to our two speakers this evening. Thank you. Melissa, are you there? I'm still here, but I haven't joined the room yet. It won't untoggle. <laughs> We're going to untoggle you soon. I don't know why it's not untoggling. Benedict, I'm going to take you off the screen. Hang on. Fine. There, there she is. There we go. Yay. Really? Thank you. And thank you, Benedict. Um, we are all, we're really excited to be here or well, in our respective homes. I'm in New York, Jennifer's in Massachusetts. Uh, we figured we'd talk through some of the big elements of unacceptable, what makes this such a wild scandal and save a bunch of time for some discussion with Benedict and also audience questions. Uh, so one of the best places to start is sort of at the end, which is where we came in. <laughs> March 12th, 2019, uh, I went into to the office in Boston, the Wall Street Journal has a bureau, and Melissa is in New York, and it was about 10 o'clock in the morning, and we started to get some emails and notifications that there was going to be a big press conference at the U.S. Attorney's Office in Boston very soon, and it was clear something big was going on. Uh, stuff was coming from the FBI in Washington, like, hey, we want to alert you to something in Boston, all eyes on Boston. So um, off I go down to the courthouse and I went up to the ninth floor and there's a small press room and it's just completely packed with reporters. And right away, you know, this is important because you've got the head of the Boston FBI, the head of the U.S. attorney in Massachusetts, um, the IRS in New England, the field director, uh, a lot of reporters. Everyone's arrayed on the stage and they unveil that day that they've been investigating for uh, more than a year. The largest college admissions scam ever prosecuted by the federal government, and it didn't just fall of one person. It was, as they put it, a catalog of wealth, parents from CEOs, Hollywood actresses, uh, fashion designer, 
very wealthy people from coast to coast, some of the most elite schools in the country, including uh, Yale, uh, Georgetown, USC, uh, University of Texas, and then of course the mastermind himself. And they told us that Rick Singer, the ringleader, would actually plead guilty that very day in Boston. So as you can imagine, this was a, a huge case um, that had a lot of tentacles. And we were, Jennifer and I were working, a colleague, um, one of our editors had printed out the FBI affidavit, which is over 200 pages of uh, snippets from phone calls, wiretap phone calls, transcripts of discussions. And it was such juicy reading, just that. I mean, they could put that into a book and make it great. Uh, but we were pouring through that, catching our breath from this torrent of updates to the news articles when literary agents started to reach out. Um, and this is not, for anybody in the book world, this is not the way it normally works. We are very grateful that it happened this way. But uh, Jennifer and I were approached the, the day the story broke about whether we wanted to turn this into a book because we just knew, everyone knew so quickly that it was gonna be a, a big deal. Uh, so for those of you who aren't familiar with the scandal, there are two main prongs. So we'll walk through kind of how it worked. So the first one uh, that was organized by the scheme's ringleader, Rick Singer, was testing, where he would have, uh, he would encourage his clients' kids to be tested for learning differences, which would allow them to get extra time to take the SAT or ACT. Then that extra time allowed them to take the test in different locations, and he would send them to what he called his testing centers, uh, places that he controlled, and he paid off the test site administrators and a proctor to help juice the scores of these teens. Um, it you know, certainly made their applications look stronger. The other prong was athletics, uh, fraud and bribery, where Singer would pitch these applicants as recruited athletes to kind of lower level sports, lower tier sports, non-revenue programs like sailing and crew and soccer, you know, we're not talking football and basketball here. There's plenty of attention on those. These are the sports that, frankly, people just weren't paying attention to who made the roster. They would uh, be admitted as athletes, but without ever playing. Uh, some didn't even play the sport in high school. And it was in exchange for some money that went generally to the coach, sometimes to the athletic program, sometimes directly to the coach's pockets. And again, Rick Singer coordinated this whole thing, and he was the the hub of all of it. We, uh, right away, we were struck by how, frankly, creative this, this scheme was. And we were thinking, how did this guy figure this out? So we traced uh, Rick Singer's childhood through his adult years, trying to figure out where did he get this idea? And what we realized is that um, it's pretty clear he learned about it as a coach. He was a basketball coach himself in Sacramento, at Sacramento State. Uh, so he, he traveled the country, and he was the type of person who could never sit still. So if he was at a campus, he would always meet everyone. He had this huge uh, Rolodex of coaches, and he really got to know that world, and people could really talk to him. And he realized a couple crucial things for this scam. Uh, he realized that athletes have incredible advantages when they apply to college. And this isn't just your scholarship athletes, but this is walk-ons. If you can just simply fill a slot on a team, you have a much better chance. Um, almost, it's almost a guarantee at some schools if, you, if you're going to play on the tennis team uh, or row crew or something. And so he realized that. And the other thing he realized is that there's a real lack of oversight uh, with these coaches. On, as Melissa said, on some of these lower level sports, they almost, it was almost like their little fiefdom um, and the third thing he realized is that schools rely on coaches to do a lot of fundraising. Uh, and this was a real weak link because the coaches didn't want to do fundraising. They wanted to be out on the, on the fields and so forth. And so if he could go to some of these coaches that weren't being observed and said, look, I can help you meet your fundraising goals and give you some money. Oh, and by the way, um, uh, you know, maybe I can give you a little money for yourself as well. Um, and he, there were signs he was doing this, um, you know, we know in the 2000s he was into it, but even by the late 90s, he was willing to take 
sort of sketchy paths for parents and, and stretch the truth on essays and get people to apply uh, as ethnicities they weren't. And he was always working the system. So, and he realized parents were willing to pay for that. And it's not like these kids were actually disadvantaged in the admissions process to begin with, right? They were not the people who, you know, I should say their families, many of them had gone to college, they had connections, they had, uh, they were legacies at some of the schools to which they were applying. They had, many of them attended high schools with tremendously rich uh, resources for college counseling, you know, ratios of 30 students to a counselor, the national average is a few hundred students to a counselor. So they had plenty of support through this process. So something we kind of talk a lot about is why the families did this. And uh, I think actually Tony Jack, who's um, at Harvard and did the New York Times review of the book, he referred to bumper stickers and bragging rights. And that's ultimately what so much of this came down to, this desire for prestige. Uh, and that caught up so many of the families that ended up involved in this. Right, we get asked all the time what drove these parents to engage. And we, um, we did um, so many interviews trying to figure out that question and we got too many of the people involved. And we concluded that there were a few reasons why people did this. Um, ego was a big one, as Melissa talked about the bumper sticker idea, um, insecurity, um, and then there were some parents in court who said that, you know, look, I, 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 I loved my kid and this was I, in my mis misguided way, this is what I did. Um, there was um, also just sort of naked ambition. I think in some, some of these cases, you're talking about people who had moved in very elite circles for a long time, and they were suddenly being told that uh, you, you weren't gonna be part of the club anymore. Um, your kid is, you know, a B student, uh, just a good kid, like a lot of other kids, probably going to have to, can't go to the school you want, not an elite school. And, um, and they, they couldn't quite accept that. They weren't used to hearing no. As um, one college counselor told us that, you know, that she runs into this, there are some parents who they, they just haven't been told no, and they, they don't want to. And you didn't have to with Rick Singer. You didn't have to hear no. Um, and then another thing was um, almost a wor worked worldview. There were... Um, these were people who um, were focused on a very small set of schools. That struck us throughout the reporting is that we know there's lots and lots of good schools that you can go to and have a perfectly fine life. And in fact, like most schools actually admit most kids. But when you talk to parents in these communities, they would think that you would think there are about 20 schools that you could go to. And they were just obsessed with, with going to one of them. So it was sort of a warped worldview. Right, this insularity that just breeds this very strange assumption about success and what, what success means. And we spend a lot of time in the book, you know, we, we go into the, the details of the scandal, the scheme itself, and the people involved with really unprecedented access to some of those players. But we also put it in context of what's happening in college admissions during this time that perhaps fueled this anxiety. and helped parents think that they actually needed to do something quite so extreme as lie, cheat, and steal to, to get their kids into school. So there's, you know, we talk about the rise of college rankings and what that did to the, the college search process. Talk about this, um, this discussion of fit and how that kind of disappeared. We had one person tell us that talking about fit when you're talking about college is like screaming into the void. Uh, we had somebody refer to admissions as blood sport. Uh, these are pretty vivid terms, and it really does reflect the the environment in which many of these families were, were raising their children. And we were also really fascinated with how parents and, and anyone reading this book was going to see these mothers and fathers. Were they going to see them as just greedy? Were they going to relate to them at all? And it's been it's been really enlightening. Um, I think that one of the reasons that people were so upset was not because necessarily they just wanted, they're really rich and you wanna see rich people fail. I mean, there, I think there was probably a little schadenfreude in there, but I think it was because as one of the judges said, basically she said, you know, you already had so many advantages. You had the schools and you had the, the, the test prep tutors. I mean, some of these parents were paying 500 an hour for test prep. So it was almost like, you know, you're already on third and then you had to take this extra step. So I think that that really wrangles people. Um, 
And and then I think, um, you know, some people feel that, that they feel anger. Parents are just sort of entitled, um, you know, setting a terrible example for their kids. And if you have money and power, the rules don't apply to you. And then even I think we were just talking with some some parents today said in their community that, you know, yes, people are mad, um, but it's there's also a bit of um, a feeling of somebody else, a little undercurrent of somebody's getting an edge or not. It's and a little bit of jealousy almost. Like right, there what kind of things are happening out there that I don't that I don't know about. So I think that one thing that's kind of interesting about the book is as much as you want to hate some people, I think, you know, you can try to look at some of it and and we we get into a lot of gray areas how this is like a dial up from a lot of things, but there's some stuff that people regularly do that is could be considered, you know, on the same in the same family. <laughs> The thing that really got me as we reported out this book and dug deeper into some of the parents in particular, we kind of feature, I don't know, six or seven families kind of more deeply, uh, is that I'm a parent and I want what's best for my kid and I don't always know how to do that. And I found myself starting to relate to little pieces of some of these parents, not sympathizing, not excusing them, but seeing a little bit of myself in what drove some of them to do what they did. Right? There's this universal desire to help your child succeed and avoid disappointment. It's just a question of how far you'll go to get there. And I think we, we try to tease out some of that nuance that, again, as Jennifer said, these aren't, this isn't black and white, good and bad people. It's, they're complicated people. And they were, and they were all different too. Uh, some of the parents signed on with uh, Rick Singer, really because of his offerings. They knew about the side door or the test, the test help, um, you know, the athletic scheme. They'd heard about it. It was very transactional, like calling him, and there was very little talk in the beginning. And they got right down to business. Um, there were other people that signed on with him, and they, it took them, you know, a year to cross the line, uh, and. Th you know, they, they got themselves, you could almost see some people just spiraling into this, this mess, um, almost in a comic, comical way as they try to justify the action, their actions to themselves. Uh, there was one parent that we were just so struck by. She wound up hiring Rick Singer to tutor her son, and they were just proceeding along normally with schools. And then she became convinced that he just wasn't going to get into the school of of choice, um, which they were looking at USC. Um, he was a very good student, but it just was on the bubble, not a sure thing. So they decided to go for the test scheme uh, where you would have the kid travel. We'll talk more about the, how it worked later, but you'd actually have the kid travel to a testing site Singer had corrupted. Um, and she got, you saw her go through this point where uh, at the last minute her son got sick and so she could have at that moment just said, okay, that's for the best. Like, this is a signal that this isn't going to work. But she decided that she was going to have Rick's, one of Rick Singer's uh, corrupt proctors take the test and pretend to be her son. So she already crossed into a new territory there. But then she had the problem of how do I explain this to my son? He's going to realize I'm not taking the ACT. All my kids, are, all my friends are taking it. What do I do? So she lies to her son. And she says that she's secured this special arrangement to give him the test at home and to be a proctor. And this sounds nuts, like what kid would do this? But this happens to be a very um, wealthy family of, of this woman is just, um, she kind of is, is like a rainmaker. She makes everything happen. I mean, parties just appear, plans get made, you know, flying across country for a red eye for a meeting. Like that's the kind of life. And so it didn't maybe seem that, far-fetched if we want to give him the benefit of the doubt but she decides to give him the test at home she sets him up at the dining room table um, she has the timer on she goes through the whole thing she she's like you've got to finish now she, and then because she it just she wanted to kind of convince herself this is to the such a great illustration of how she had really just lied to herself she put it in an envelope and she sort of like sent it to nowhere um, and she just, you know, thought that somehow going through the motions made it real. I just so love that story so much. Um, just a reminder to type your questions in. We love, we want to know what you guys want to know about the book, about the reporting of it, about the scandal in general. So add your questions to the ask a question or the, the chat. Um, you know, when we were writing this book, we, we try not to be preachy. 
right? We're not saying these are all awful people and society is awful and everything, but this scandal doesn't happen and doesn't live in a vacuum. So in Unacceptable, we dig into what it says about our society, that people felt the need to go to such great lengths and got away with it for so long. I think that's a big part of it. Um, and in this moment when discussions about fairness and equality and access are a part of the national dialogue, uh, so I think a lot of the book really resonates. And there's one scene in particular that I'm going to read from the book just briefly. Uh, I don't want to give away all the book, of course, but here's the cover. Um, it's the beginning of a chapter. Presiding over a packed courtroom on Friday, the 13th of September, Judge Talwani held her eyeglasses between her thumb and index finger and peered out at the solemn defendant before her. The judge had been reflecting on why there was a sense of moral outrage in the college admissions case. It wasn't because the public had suddenly discovered that it's not a true meritocracy out there. It wasn't about the financial harm to the colleges or the testing agencies that had generated the technical infighting at the courthouse in recent days. The outrage, she said from the bench, is a system that is already so distorted by money and privilege in the first place. And the outrage, the judge continued, looking directly at actress Felicity Huffman, was, quote, that you took the step of obtaining one more advantage to put your child ahead of theirs. It's, it's hard to understate how much these themes kind of course through everything we're talking about in everyday life right now about um, who gets what and is it fair? And if it's not fair, why is it not fair? Um, but one of the, th the biggest takeaways we had from the book was well, Jennifer, why don't you talk about Matteo? Uh, yes, Matteo Sloan uh, was 20 years old when we spoke with him and his father uh, paid Rick Singer to present Matteo as a water polo player to uh, get him into USC. Um, he did not play water polo. Uh, he uh, was left in the, in the dark about this. Um, he did not see the final application that went in and he um, was in college thinking that he'd gotten there on his own merit when he learned about this and his father came home that day. Um, we got the, um, what I believe is still the only um, interview with any of the, the teens involved in um, in this whole thing and everybody wanted to hear from them and, and I was, I'm really proud that we did talk to him because uh, this book really is at, at its heart about a lot of kids who weren't listened to. Um, and so he did get a voice and we wanted to know what he said and what he thought was the problem. We go into that length, but what he says is um, that, that this, he felt the big problem was parents were too invested in their kids' lives. Um, and he didn't mean like that they helped them and you know got them into good schools and all that, which is great, but that they were too invested in their, in their accomplishments as their own that he felt that they, you could tell as a kid how important, how much your parent uh, loved talking about your accomplishments and how big of a part of their identity it was. And that was a burden for him and his friends. Um, and it stressed them out. And he knew that his parents um, and his friend's parents saw their kid's success as a reflection of themselves. So again, we wanna give you just a little kind of teaser about the book, talk a little bit about it. Um, hope that we're interesting you uh, and you would wanna read more about it. Before we came on, we were chatting with Benedict a little bit about uh, some other elements of the book. And I know that he has some questions. Uh, so hopefully we can continue that part of the conversation now. I don't know if his audio is working. Hey there. <laughs> Dark all of a sudden. Uh <laughs> Are you in the dark? <laughs> I, I, I don't know what's happened. Oh my, God. Um, oh my gosh. It, yeah, hold on a second. It's, kind of uh, it's just, I, I need to turn on a light. It's very dramatic. <laughs> it's not a scary story, I swear. It's right. not a ghost it's, story. It's sort of fitting for a Halloween time. Um, what, what, what I thought was very interesting, in fact, uh, I mean, first of all, we know uh, across the board in society that the, the elite and the well-to-do always have had a leg up to get into these elite colleges. There's been a slew of articles I've been reading recently. I mean, it just, this whole system is skewed. Uh, you know, the, the legacies, the, I mean, it just goes on and on and on. 
what I found interesting was uh, Singer's background. You know, it um, it really is a hop and a skip away from being a, you know, helping the kid with an essay to, I mean, I can, I can, uh, I can say that there was a guy that lived in the house that I lived in in Austin, Texas, 35 years ago, and he made his living writing papers for people. And there was a, just a stream of frat boys coming through cash being exchanged and, you know, uh, big papers on gun control being cranked down and, you know, so it, it, it's, it's, uh, uh, I guess that's not a question, but, um, you know, the, I, I mentioned it earlier. Uh, it, it just seemed back when I was taking the SAT, it was so secure. I mean, you know, I, I just, I can't imagine that you could convince the authorities that you can, oh yeah, I'll take the test at home. I mean, it, it, it just was ludicrous. So it probably wasn't that secure when you took it. Uh, you just thought it was. Um, and there have been a few really crazy cheating rings over the years uh, tied to the SAT and the ACT. And some of those loopholes were closed after authorities found out about them, but obviously not every loophole was closed. And ultimately one of the challenges is the college board and the ACT outsourced the administration of the test. So people from the high school or from you know the, just the local community, they're the ones who to have everyone sit down and make you know check everyone in and run the test and uh you know they're the test site administrators and it turned out that some of them at least were very easily corruptible so jennifer got to dig in uh, to one of the prior scandals in particular and kind of what problems they thought they were going to fix uh but singer found a workaround Yes, that's right. There was a big scandal in uh, in Long Island uh, where some student, a principal, uh, realized that a lot of kids were getting much higher scores than he thought, and um, they dug into this. And one of the kids cracked and said, "Yeah, there's a, a kid here who's taking tests for everyone." Um, actually, he was a graduate who had such a racket going. He was flying home from college on weekends to to take tests, uh, and because. There really was no, this, the ID situation was just really loosey goosey. So he was going in. And um, so that's how Singer started, too. He had this very brilliant test taker. This guy was amazing. Uh, Mark Riddell, um, he's pleaded guilty. He worked at IMG Academy, he was test prep coordinator. Singer connects with him through the, the IMG world. Mark Riddell um, went to Harvard. He has this ability to not just ace test, but to get just the score you need because you couldn't go in and get a perfect score. You know, it just would look weird. It would raise alarm. So he would just figure it out. He could go in and get just the test the score they needed. Um, well, then this um, Long Island scandal broke right around the time Mark Riddell was was starting. He did it a few times for Singer's clients. He went in. He even uh, he's a six foot six blonde guy. Um, he was able to go in and take the test for for two kids from uh, whose parents were from India. Um, so that tells you the security system was not good with a fake ID. Um, and then um, the Long Island thing kind of blows up. So Singer gets this great idea, which um, we mentioned earlier, which is, you know, he gets his schools. One's in Houston, one's in West Hollywood. And he literally just like bribes the gatekeepers there, the administrators, he pays them not huge amounts of money, but just like- A couple thousand you know, dollars per test, yeah. Yeah, you know, just look the other way. Let Mark Riddell come in and just sort of work with the kids. Now remember the kids already have, um, they have learning disabilities, some real, some a little dubious. So they're getting special arrangements. So they're getting like private rooms, you know, all this. So you get the kid isolated, Mark Riddell comes in and he would have the kid take the test and then fix it after they tell the kid like the student don't write on the sheet the scantron write on this piece of paper we're going to transfer it over uh you'll be less stressed whatever and he would come in and fix the test and in some cases he sat right with the kids and so the, they the, there's no doubt that that the students knew uh but it was just it was a he he was just sort of brilliant in figuring out the links like one was a public school just this um test woman who was a very low, very poorly paid. Uh, and he paid her some money. The other was a school, in, you know, as we mentioned in West Hollywood, that was really struggling it was around all these wealthier schools and it was doing terrible. But, you know, it was it does raise a lot of questions. I mean, why didn't somebody realize that this one school had so many, you know, 
Mark Riddell was proctoring so many tests at this one school and it, it well, you know, what it makes me think is uh, it, what it makes me really, we, we overemphasize uh, this need for these degrees. There was a very good article that came out in the New York Times a few weeks ago about uh, the way that that's the last preserve of discrimination is how we discriminate against people who don't have the fancy degrees. So, you know, uh, and, and one wishes that we could return to the sort of practical knowledge uh, in many, you know, people have this idea the minute you don't have a college degree you just must be a dummy uh and 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 it's just a shame that it's become so just a, so the stakes are so high that you know it's like in japan where you see you know look i'm from france i mean in france it is just when you meet someone from france and they're a top executive somewhere they have been through the ringer i mean it's just unbelievable the 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 baccalauréat and then the, the 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 exams i mean it's hardcore uh, one wishes we could turn down the heat somehow so that there would be less of a need for this kind of scam. But and that's that was one of the really troubling things, I think, about this. You know, it's not just having a college degree, right? For a lot of these families, for much of society, it's having a degree from a particular set of schools. And those usually aren't like Cal State Long Beach or, you know. It, now, wait a minute. It, it, my alma mater, no, just kidding. No, but I mean, you know, you've got a ton of schools in Providence, right? And there are certain ones that people slap the bumper sticker on. Other ones, maybe they wouldn't or aren't as well known nationally. So people assume they're not as good, even if they are. Uh, and that's something that there are so many reasons why people's lists of kind of target colleges are so small and so repetitive. But it's something that uh, I would love to see college counselors, high school people, teachers, principals really kind of shift the narrative on that. And they can, right? We we have schools saying, we're so excited for wherever our graduates end up. We're proud of them. They go to this wide range of schools, but then on their website or on their you know college counseling list, they only show the schools that they're really proud of, right? They'll only highlight, you know, Duke and the Ivies and Stanford uh, and the state schools just don't ever appear on that list. And what kind of message does that send to the teams? Yeah. It, it, hold on a second. Uh, can you guys be quiet, please? I'm so sorry. Um, <laughs> That's okay. Going crazy. The joy um, of work from home. Wow. So um, I, I asked you this earlier. So Singer right now is awaiting a sentence. Uh, you know, what are they waiting for? Because, I mean, everybody else has been sentenced, right? Mm -mm. He, so, well, yeah. He, well, he did. <laughs> um, Singer uh, is the government's key witness. And so in a big federal trial where you have many people getting sentenced, usually have the main witness go last. And the reason is, is because he's going to get credit for all the people that he brought down. And right. so he, he wants that. He wants to go last and he's going to participate in their trial in some way. So right. So it's for that. And it's, it's important to note, there have been a lot of parents sentenced. Um, there have been a few other people sentenced. There are still a lot of people who are maintaining their innocence in this case. And there will be two trials for parents beginning in 2021. Uh, one will is currently scheduled to start in January. It'll probably be pushed back uh, because of the pandemic. Uh, and then there will also be a trial for some of the coaches who have pleaded not guilty, including uh, Gordy Ernst, who is uh, right, from Rhode, Rhode Island's own. Um, and he yeah. is taking this to trial as of now. So this is very far from over still. Wow. I wonder, you know, boy, and Lori Laughlin, she was recalcitrant. And then, she, you know, then all of a sudden, two months at Club Fed, you kind of, it seems, uh, it seems a bit light. Uh, and I know people were, I, I read about it, were outraged. Um, uh, you know, anyway, we, go we ahead. were at a fun point in our book process when uh, she and her husband, Massimo Giannulli, pleaded guilty. And we kind of had to, the, the book was pretty much done. It was about to go off to the press, to the printer, and we quick scrambled and updated a few paragraphs to be able to include that they had pleaded guilty, um, but still not quite uh, kind of declared their guilt. They had officially pleaded guilty, but what they were still saying to, to other people uh, put some of that kind of ownership of blame into question.
it'll be interesting to see how many how many years Singer gets because you know it, it really is perceived as a sort of white collar crime. But when you think about you know that kid from Nebraska who has just worked and worked and gets denied the opportunity, which can be life changing, it, it, it really is a crime. It you know it's a shame really. Uh, Jennifer, do you want to talk about the victim discussion a little bit? Kind of who the victims are. Yes, it, one of the um, you're kind of talking about why the light sentences, um, what pers people are perceiving as um, as light sentences. This case was a really tricky legal case uh, because, you know, a fraud case has to have some sort of financial victim, and so they, the government brought it. And it, there was a point where it almost seemed like it was going to fall apart because when you think about it, the colleges universities still got their tuition. The parents got in and they still paid. So there was this question of who lost money. And in fact, like nobody lost money. The colleges still gained money. And in some cases, their athletic programs gained money. So it was a very odd situation legally. And that's one reason why you're seeing these, um, these sentences that don't feel uh, very big. Uh, the government wanted a year or more for some of these parents, and they ended up at the most so far getting nine months. Um, but the reason why they got any jail time, I mean, in this, if, if you're, if you're, if it's a no financial loss crime, a lot of times it's just probation in a white collar crime. But the judges really realized um, that there were, there was a victim here, and everyone knew who the victim was. It was that kid you're talking about from Nebraska who had worked hard and who had had not gotten in, who didn't get the opportunity. Um, they, I mean, there was a case that we go into in the book where Singer needed to present a kid as a um, pole vaulter. And he just went on the internet and ripped off a photo of a real pole vaulter in Texas. So we found that young man. And what had gone into that photo was two years of financial sacrifice by his family uh, to get him help, to get him to lessons, driving in a truck 80 miles three times a week for coaching, injuries, uh, and they just took that with a click. And, he, and so that's that's a victim. That's the type of person. And and there were actual cases at USC where um, someone got in, one of these students got in corruptly, and someone did not get in, did not get to the next level. Yeah, it's a real shame, real shame. Uh, let's see, do we, uh, I'm not seeing any questions, um, and the storm has arrived, so at any moment, uh, oh, no. at any moment, we could be losing power, and I'll be back in the dark. Uh, <laughs> well, you know, this has really been fascinating. Uh, you know, I see um, that your, your report is for higher education. Is there, is there another scam on the horizon that we need to be aware of that you're going to uncover? Uh so for most of the last year and a half, I wrote just about the Varsity Blues case. And then starting in around March, I've been writing just about the pandemic's impact on colleges and universities. Uh, hopefully we'll be continuing to uncover more. And again, we'll have plenty more to say about this story. We'll continue to cover it for the Wall Street Journal uh, and hopefully at some point update the book uh, when there is kind of more conclusion, but we, there was enough to say now, certainly, um, and enough to kind of take away is to write it now. Uh, Jennifer is a general assignment national reporter and writes about plenty of scandals in pr plenty of different cases and scenarios and parts of the country. Oh yeah. So if any, if anybody listening knows of any, feel free, <laughs> feel free to send us a tip. The whole co-author, uh, you know, how, how does that work? You, you, you would each uncover new, new angles and then share the drafts and no yeah. singers of this, uh, big, you know? Big Google Doc. Uh, we, we really got into the Google Docs and we basically, we did a huge outline and then we split up the, the chapters. And so one of us would focus on one family or part of the case and then we shared. Right, we each kind of adopted different characters from the book to get to really dig in on. We had spreadsheets of all the lawyers, because these families, it's very different from many other types of stories we've covered, right? The parents were all lawyered up with top line uh, criminal defense attorneys, all former federal prosecutors, partners at big law firms now. 
uh, and the, many of them had crisis communications teams around them. So just getting access was especially difficult in this for this story. So we had spreadsheets keeping track of who we had been talking to and when and who contacted them last. Uh, we would each write sections, swap them, edit each other, write behind each other, brainstorm, I, you know, oh, this should be a good way into a, uh, into a chapter. The great thing was Jennifer and I had never really worked together before this. Uh, we knew each other, but we had never written anything together before. So we kind of just jumped in and it worked out very well. Amazing. It'll be interesting to see too uh, how your book might impact the sentencing, you know, since you've uncovered and really kind of fleshed out the whole story. Singer, he, he's not going to like you much, I don't think. Uh, <laughs> you know, he's probably like, wish they hadn't written the book, but, um, you know. Well, we maintained the same standards as we have for the journal in terms of uh, no surprises. So we gave people a chance to respond, to know what was being said about them. Uh, you know, we wanted to make this a very full story. And right, the, the part of the story the prosecutors were telling in court is part of the story. And the part of the story that the defense attorneys were saying was again, just part of it. So we kind of had to figure out somewhere in the middle, plus other people's insights and uh, recollections were able to get a, get a fuller picture. But uh, we used the same level of fact checking and you know, uh, commitment to accuracy. Yeah. So some people might not like what's in the book, but it's accurate and they can't take, you know, they can't quibble with that. Right. I think, I think Singer, um, you know, he, he looked really bad in the court files and that they, they've had, a, it was a 204 page affidavit of all the wrongdoing. I think, I don't want to say he looks worse in the book because you get to learn about him as a full, a full person and he's complicated, just like the parents. He's interesting. He has an interesting, we go into his childhood. We talk to people who knew him really. We talk to people who liked him a ton. Um, so I think that people who've read it have come away with, huh, okay. I'm not sure what to make of, of, of him either. I mean, it's kind of like the rule of journalism. When you learn more about people, it's harder to just put them in one bucket, you know? Well, in this crime, as we've said, I mean, it, it's, it's one of those crimes you, you, you know, can't be that bad, uh, you know, no money lost, that kind of thing. But, um, okay. Uh, ladies, I'm looking in the dark at, um, what I'm supposed to say next. Uh, excuse me. Um, I want to certainly thank you both. I mean, it was really, really fascinating. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's a great tale in, in a way. Uh, uh, it's a sad tale in one sense, but uh, it's, a, it's a fascinating story. Uh, and um, I want to thank you both for, for agreeing to speak with our listeners who I'm sure... Uh, oh, here's a question. Yes. Uh, let me, uh, oh, it was a fascinating thank you from Candy. <laughs> Uh, so I think everybody agrees with that statement. Uh, I want to then, uh, if you if you could excuse me, I'm going to just uh, mention what's coming up next week. Uh, and thank you again. Um, next Thursday, uh, first of all, next Wednesday, excuse me, uh, Mr. Marquard, Ed Marquard, who is this amazing um, classical musician and uh, choir leader. Uh, he's the dream um, sort of guide through the thicket that is classical music. Uh, he will be doing the later 19th century part two, Tchaikovsky and the Mighty Five. And uh, you don't want to miss it. This guy will uh, show you things that you, you never paid attention to. That's the case for me. And then that uh, the next day on next Thursday, October 15th, uh, we're going to again have a discussion uh, but this time with uh, Joseph Alderman of Framingham State University in Massachusetts, who has written a very important book on the early post office in the colonial times and the circulation of printed matter and of information. And uh, we're going to learn fascinating parallels uh, in his historization of the postal service in the colonial times and uh, how in many ways, uh, the Postal Service has always had, has always been politically charged, just as it is currently. So you won't want to miss that. Um, I'll just read you real quick the little blurbage. 
Uh, the history of the U.S. Postal Service, so often misconstrued today as an inert public service, the U.S. Postal Service was in fact central to our nation's founding, functioning in colonial times as the principal means of communication, as well as the conduit for the diffusion of printed matter of all types. For these reasons, control of colonial mail service was the subject of intense politically steep maneuverings directly paralleling current issues on the eve of the 2020 presidential election. And it'll be a new format where uh, I'll be discussing and asking questions and hopefully I won't look too much like a dummy. So um, anyways, thank you all so much. And I want to thank our speakers again. And I want to thank uh, everyone watching. And uh, by all means, join the Redwood and subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can see this whole program uh, as it has been recorded and will be posted on our YouTube channel. Thank you all and good evening. Thank you so much.